This is a production of Cornell University. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction, and it's um, it's really great to be here. Um, I, great to be here giving um, a seminar, and uh, so I'm going to focus um, mostly on phosphorus. I think in my abstract I had listed nitrogen as well, and I was hoping to bring in some of the work that we're doing on nitrogen, but I just recently gave a a talk uh, at the at a symposium on phosphorus that was uh, in, down in Annapolis just a couple months ago, and so I kind of built my talk around that one and kind of expanded a little bit. So uh, I think I'm going to spend most of my time talking about phosphorus and the role of hydrology and connecting phosphorus sources on the landscape to receiving waters. Um, and it's going to be a tour of the Chesapeake Bay and, and mostly a lot of the research we're doing, and then highlighting you know some research from others uh, that kind of helps to tell the story. Um, so I've kind of, I've broken this presentation out into four parts, um, starting uh, with kind of the sloped upland regions of the Chesapeake Bay, um, focusing on some issues in the coastal plain lowlands, um, mostly in the Delmarva Peninsula where we do a lot of work, um, where artificial drainage is a kind of, a, is, a, is a primary concern. Streams and rivers, so just the connectivity that occurs, um, you know, in streams and rivers, moving nutrients, uh, moving phosphorus, you know, to downstream receiving it waters, and then emerging concerns, just some things I see as kind of emerging concerns in nutrient management, you know, that we should probably be paying attention to in the future. Uh, so I'm going to start with an area that I know really well, and I see Todd Walters here, and he's probably seen some of these slides before, um, but we do a lot of work on variable source area hydrology, as does uh, the many groups, as do many groups here at Cornell. Um, and so a lot of people have contributed to the kind of the ideas on the role of variable source area hydrology in connecting nutrient sources with receiving waters. Here's Cornell, this is where we are now, just outside of the Chesapeake Bay. I do a lot of work at the Mahantango Creek Experimental Watersheds, uh, mostly this little uh, 7.3 square kilometer uh, watershed known as W38, it's kind of a colloquial name, um, but we have a gridded system that you know, names our watershed, so it, um, it's kind of an interesting name. And there are two subcatchments in W38 where we do quite a bit of experimental work. One's FD36, which I'll refer to a little bit later, and one is Mattern, it's an 11 hectare experimental watershed um, where we've done some work on variable source hydrology and nutrient loss. Um, and so we have uh, kind of you know, two different kinds of soil conditions in this watershed. We have upland soils here that lack, say, some kind of a discontinuity in soils that would perch water, so they're well-drained soils that don't have a fragile pan. And then you know, here in these lower landscape positions, we have fragile pans, and they um, are basically impede vertical movement of water and will perch water and will create areas of saturation. And this kind of this highlights, you know, you can see the, the nature of these well-drained soils and compare them you know, to the poorly drained soils that we find here. Um, and we go out, we send technicians. We've done this quite a bit over the years, um, kind of a very low-tech technique for looking at areas of saturation in landscape. We call it the wet boot, or um, you've probably seen in the literature even as the squishy boot technique. Um, honestly, there are papers published with that in the title. Um, out of Europe, especially, they've, they've tried to actually quantitate uh, this method. Um, but anyway, so you, you, you know, we'll go out seasonally and just find areas of saturation and take a GPS unit and essentially map them. You know? So you can see here in August of 2003, for example, you know, the location of some saturated areas. Um, these are disconnected satura saturated areas, so uh, assuming they didn't you know, you know, change over time with any kind of a rainfall event, they're unlikely to connect to the stream. But you could compare that to something later in the fall after we've had a chance to wet up a bit. Um, you know, these saturated areas expand quite a bit, and now these are connected to this little ephemeral stream here, so any nutrient loss that occurs in these zones um, would be a risk to water quality. Um, there's two types of runoff genera generation mechanisms that we're concerned with, um, largely, you know, infiltration excess runoff in these zones where we have well-drained soils where, you know, basically it takes a pretty extreme rainfall, like a thunderstorm or high-intensity rain <laughs> to exceed the infiltration capacity of the soils and to, and to generate runoff. Um, and you can contrast that against, you know, what we normally see in these zones, which is kind of a perch saturation excess runoff phenomenon, where these soils are saturated and any excess rainfall runs off, and they're also close to the stream, so there's an increased risk of runoff connecting to the stream and then nutrient loss. <laughs> so if we zoom in on this hill slope here, we've done years of, you know, plot scale runoff monitoring at these sites. And so these are just totals for about three years of monitoring, um, say 2002 to 2004, I think. And so you can see most of what we're generating, most of the runoff that's being generated in, the, in these well-drained soils here is infiltration excess runoff. 
and largely at the lower landscape position, um, it's saturation excess runoff. We're using shallow wells and looking at the, the, the status of the water table and also soil moisture sensors to infer these runoff generation mechanisms. But you know, over this time period, most of what we get down here is, is you know, saturation excess runoff. These are you know, largely saturated areas for you know, large parts of the year. And then the management that's imposed on this landscape, um, you can see that the, the trends in soil phosphorus moving up the slope um, here at the lower landscape position, we're just above agronomic optimum in terms of you know, soil phosphorus concentrations, about 78 parts per million. That's just above what's needed to grow crops. Um, but if you move up the slope, you know, where we're receiving more repeated applications of, say, manure fertilizer, we have much higher soil phosphorus concentrations. And so if you just relate those soil phosphorus concentrations to the dissolved phosphorus concentrations and runoff, you get a, you know, a, a increasing amounts of dissolved P and runoff with higher soil phosphorus concentrations. And that's a, that's a relationship that's been shown over and over in the literature. But just because we know that doesn't mean that we can necessarily predict the load. The load is driven by uh, the amount of runoff that's generated from a particular zone. And so when we look at the loads that we get from these regions, it's really this region here, just because of its high, you know, high large amounts of runoff that are generated, the high volumes of runoff that we get, those are where we see the high loads. And so these are areas of the landscape that we call critical source areas um, or hydrologically sensitive areas that go by lots of names. Um, but essentially the same thing, you know, where you have a source and a transport mechanism and it's in prox it's it's close to the stream, and so you, there's a higher risk of phosphorus loss uh, from these regions of the landscape. So we've done some extra work looking at you know, zo these zones of saturation. Um, this is some work that uh, Mark Williams, who was a PhD student at Penn State, was doing. Um, you know, well, first I'll just back up and just show that you know, these are kind of another look at these variable, variably saturated areas in the landscape. But uh, Mark came in. Um, he set up a network of piezometers in these saturated areas, and, and this is the FD36 watershed just north of Mattern, um, also within the kind of the Mad Tango Creek experimental watersheds. And we used electrical resistivity imaging to try to understand a little bit about the, the subsurface connectivity that we have, you know, what, what maintains saturation in these, in these portions of the landscape. And so it's kind of fortuitous because we didn't do it for, for all that long. Uh, we were only able to do it for one season. Essentially what you do is you, is you use electrodes um, in a transect here and you're basically sending electric pulses um, and measuring uh, you know, certain between current electrodes and potential electrodes and you know, changes in resistivity can be used to infer changes in soil moisture content. Um, it's also sensitive to changes in soil temperature um, and to any kind of conductive solution. Uh, but if you can control for the other things that affect it, you can infer that you know, what we're seeing is really due to changes in saturation. Um, and so. We did some monitoring over a series of storm events that, that wet up the landscape. And so you can see here, um, you know, these are the, where you see decreased resist resistivity um, here. And we know that we have a Fragipan uh, just about 60 centimeters below the surface. So you can see that boundary really clearly. So that, we're kind of concluding from this is that this is the perch water that's sitting above the Fragipan. This is an area without a groundwater seep. And then we're comparing it to this zone here where we have active seepage going on. And so when you look at the area where we have a seep, um, where we have upwelling water, you can see um, kind of an increased uh, upward gradient of groundwater. I mean, we can infer this from the piezometers that we have here. We have piezometers at different depths that allow us to look at gradients of, of water movement. And we see evidence for, you know, the saturated, this connected saturated area here, which, you know, when, you compare, when we com combine it with this evidence, it suggests that this is an area of upwelling water and seepage that we see in these zones. And this is a video that I'm not sure if I'll be able to get to play, but this was taken during, after a fairly large storm event um, in this seepage zone. You can see the kind of, see if it works. Sometimes these things don't work. And of course it, no, it will. All right, so that's kind of what you see. Um, this is after, I think this is after Tropical Storm Lee. So when we had, this is a huge amount of rain it took to cause that kind of, but so it, the ERI is kind of valuable because it allows you to, as they say, visualize. I mean, you can get quantitative information to, from it too. And I'll show you some more work we're doing with electrical resistivity imaging later. Um, but that was just some work looking at just trying to get at the saturated or these um, you know, areas of connectivity that you can see from, with soil moisture. 
So subsurface phosphorus transport is kind of an oft overlooked pathway. Um, you know, a lot of it, you know, a lot of the literature, you know, over time has suggested that most of the phosphorus is moving in overland flow, but we also see a lot moving in subsurface flow. And so we've done work uh, on a small dairy farm in the Allegheny Plateau region. And this is Pete Kleinman's work uh, where we were monitoring a spring house. Um, so this is, a, this is receiving subsurface flows from uh, up, there's fields above here uh, that would be the recharge area for the spring. But it's also uh, where a lot of manure is applied. This is a dairy farm, so they're getting pretty frequent regular applications of dairy manure. Um, this is the home here. So this spring house used to serve water for the home. It, does, it doesn't any longer, but um, they actually helped us do some monitoring. They were collecting samples from the spring house over time and then keeping track of when manure was being applied to the fields in the, in the uh, up gradient zone above the spring house. And so you can see, you know, these are the days that manure, these are the, you know, manure is kind of applied spring and fall, so April, October, and these are the times of manure application. And here's the trace of dissolved phosphorus in the spring house. And so you can see soon after manure is applied, you, you tend to get a spike, you get a pretty significant spike here in dissolved phosphorus, and then, you know, a smaller one here, and then another one here. So it's responding pretty quickly to the timing of manure application, and you get these subsurface transfers of, pho of phosphorus. Um, you know, so it's, it's not just an overland flow problem, it's also a subsurface transport problem. Things you can do to mitigate that uh, include uh, just simple uh, tillage. Uh, so it's, this is especially problematic where we have no-till and you get a lot of soil development and macropore formation. You can come in with frequent tillage and break up the macropores. And the macropores are what's, you know, serving as the, you know, one form of kind of rapid connectivity between the surface and the subsurface. And so one management tool is just to till, and you can see here, just by tilling you can reduce, um, you know, the amount of dissolved phosphorus and leachate relative to if you just broadcast on the surface and it, it can connect uh, to subsurface flow pathways. And so those are some things you can do to get at um, reducing subsurface transfers. Okay. Another <laughs> common problem, and this is kind of low-hanging fruit stuff, but another common problem that we see, you know, um, and this is some work we're doing on the Piedmont is just barnyard runoff from animal heavy, heavy use areas. Um, so, uh, just, I mean, these are the kinds of, you know, these a lot of plain sec farms uh, down in the Piedmont region. And this is, this is a manure, this spilled manure here in the barnyard area. I mean, just real simple things, but, the, but cause a major water quality problem. And so this, um, here's some photos of kind of the, the, the condition of, the of some of these barnyards that you see. Um, lots of trampled, uh, you know, animal heavy use areas. So this is all compacted soil. Um, and I get a lot of runoff just from the barn. It's from the roofs and these are impervious surface. Uh, so you get a lot of runoff from these zones. And so we've been monitoring with flumes just the, the amount of runoff that we get off these barnyards and also the quality of the water. And so just in this small area, we're generating anywhere from 20 kilograms of phosphorus per year. Now the, the, the size of the barnyard is really small, so if you actually scaled that to a, like a kilograms per hectare per year, the, the number is astronomical. It seems almost unfair to report something so high, but you get fairly substantial phosphorus losses from these barnyards. Um, and then what you have is basically, you know, either some kind of rapid connection like a gully, um, in this case here. So, I mean, that water just hits that gully and goes right down to a stream. And so we've been working actually with some kind of fancy filtration technologies to try to deal with this. Um, it's one approach, uh, so you know, we're routing water uh, into these, you know, base agrogen inlets, and it's moving in to a fairly sophisticated system that's supposed to get at not only nitrogen removal, but also phosphorus removal. This is um, Alexandra Drizzo runs a, um, she, she's been experimenting a lot from, with uh, phosphorus filtration devices at the University of Vermont. And so um, this is one of her filters using, I think, iron slag as the medium for phosphorus removal. And so these things work when the flows are low, but when you get fairly large storms, they get overwhelmed. Um, and so you're asking a lot of a, of a system like this to filter the sheer volumes of water that are being generated from this kind of an operation. And so what we found is that um, probably what's needed is just better water management, like gutters and things on the roofs and keeping the clean water clean and separating that water from the dirty water and then just trying to treat smaller volumes of the really bad stuff, because this, this gets clogged up with sediment, it gets clogged up with manure. Um, it's interesting to look at, but it, it, we've had all kinds of problems with it um, under big storms. It just uh, underperforms. But so there's a role for these things, I think, but uh, water management and just reducing the volumes of water coming off some of these sites is kind of a low hanging fruit that I think you know, would, be, would be beneficial. Mm -hmm. 
So kind of shifting gears a little bit, moving from the sloped areas down into the coastal plain, uh, we do a lot of work at the University of Maryland Eastern Shores is on the Delmarva Peninsula. So this is uh, the Minokan River watershed here. And here is the University of Maryland Eastern Shore within the Minokan. We see some pretty extreme phosphorus losses in artificial drainage um, at these sites, anywhere from two kilograms per hectare per year, all the way up to over 20 in some cases from some of the ditches uh, on the Eastern Shore. And so that's kind of the main issue um, is the role of artificial drainage and basically connecting phosphorus sources to receiving waters. And so drainage is, is really critical um, in these flat landscapes. They use it to lower water tables, um, to lower, they lower them below the rooting zone so they can grow crops. And that there's also, they can get uh, equipment out there. But the, when you do that, uh, just the act of putting in a ditch or putting in a tile, you know, you lower the water table, you increase the travel time of water in the system, um, and it also increases connectivity. You dig that ditch deeper, and that's, that's kind of an, an act of intensifying the drainage of the system. And so uh, in another way, there's two, kind of two ways to intensify the drainage. One is to, is to dig the ditch deeper or to have the tile installed at a deeper depth, but also spacing plays a role. So the more closely spaced the ditches are, the tiles are, the more intense the drainage is. Another way to look at that um, is just in terms of drainage density. And so it's kind of like a watershed hydrology approach where you just look at the length of the channels in the system divided by the area. Um, and a lot of folks have kind of looked at it this way. Uh, and so in this case here, you have a 27 acre field and, and these are the existing ditches in the field here. Um, and so you, if you calculate the drainage density, you know, based on the area of the field and the length of the ditches, it's about 0.02 meters to the negative one. The critical source areas of phosphorus contribution to these ditches are largely pretty close to the ditch. They're within five or 10 meters or so. And some of this evidence is from tracer studies that have been done elsewhere, just looking at you know, where's the contributing area, the, the kind of the annual you know, contributing area to these ditches. If you intensify the drainage, which is going on quite a bit on the Eastern shore, uh, in other words, if you just add more tiles or more ditches to the system, um, you basically you've just increased uh, not only the connectivity of the system, but also, whoops, let me back up a sec. Um, but just, you know, you in increase the contribution of phosphorus from areas that were not you know, initially connected. Now they are connected. You're connecting new phosphorus sources to drainage and more rapidly removing water from the system. Um, and so you've just increased the, air, the spatial coverage of critical source areas across uh, the basin. I know a lot of work's been done here at Cornell looking at road side ditches. And so this is kind of a similar thing. You're just increasing the artificial connectivity of the system and more rapidly <laughs> delivering nutrients uh, to streams. And so this is kind of, you know, this is the ditch drainage for agriculture problem, but there's also the roadside, you know, ditch problem that I know there's been quite a lot of work been done here uh, looking at that issue. Keith Schilling uh, in the Midwest uh, did some really interesting work just looking at the role of drainage density, increasing the density of drainage on travel times and basically showed that there's an exponential relationship between uh, the, the, the mean travel time in years and, the, and the, the drainage density of artificial drainage of either tiles or ditches. And so you can see, you know, at first, if you start to you know, rapidly increase the density of drainage, there's a pretty steep drop off, but then it levels off to a point where you can keep adding tiles or keep adding ditches and there's not much, you know, change in travel time, but it's a pretty steep drop in travel time, you know, say 15 years or so from, you know, just this, you know, from going 0.001 to 0.02. So you can change the travel times more rapidly, move water uh, off the site, but that's also a problem for, you know, phosphorus pollution and nitrogen pollution as well. These are some data from Kevin King in the Midwest, just showing um, how quickly phosphorus responds in tile drainage. Um, and so it's almost like a, you, know, you get these really rapid responses, you know, where you get upticks in flow and then phosphorus responds right away. So it just suggests very fast delivery of phosphorus to the system. And so if you combine that with evidence from Marty Shipitolo at the USDA ARS and others have done this too, um, where they've taken smoke machines and just blown smoke up the tile lines to find uh, macropores and soils, and it just shows how well connected these tiles are uh, to these, you know, small these macropore systems that form, in, especially in no-till soils. And so, you just have rapid conveyance of phosphorus, either in manure or soil phosphorus, and it gets delivered straight down the macropores into the tiles. And so, you have very rapid delivery of phosphorus out of these tiles. Um, and so it's a common problem in the Midwest, and it's in part contributing to the Lake Erie situation that you've probably all heard about, the 
uh, toxic algal blooms. Uh, a lot of that phosphorus delivery is, is in part being contributed by the tile drainage that's there and the rapid ex expansion and intensification of tile drainage that's going on throughout the Midwest. Back on the kind of the coastal plain, we see very similar kind of response in our ditches. Um, so you see, you know, very large storm event here in one of our field ditches and a very rapid response, you know, in phosphorus concentrations, really rapid rise, right, with the, timed with the peak of the uh, hydrograph. It's about, you know, 1.5 milligrams per liter. Um, so it suggests very, you know, fast flow pass. It peaks early in the hydrograph. And we've looked, uh, you know, across the landscape, you know, some, there's been some suggestion that, you know, groundwater is playing a big role. And so we, we have a lot of wells, say, and these are the, this is actually the ditch. This is this ditch right here that goes through these fields. So we have a, just a very dense network of shallow wells measuring the kind of the groundwater concentrations of phosphorus um, in the system. And if you look, uh, you know, they're on the order of, you know, at the most maybe 0.3 milligrams per liter on average. This is kind of collecting data once every two weeks throughout the year. Um, and, you know, the mean is more on the order of 0.05. And so if you just think about this in a mixing model context, as this being one of your end members uh, of phosphorus, it's unlikely that groundwater is, you know, alone, you know, is the big source, even though these ditches are largely draining the groundwater system. So there has to be another source that's contributing uh, to these fairly high peaks of phosphorus that we routinely see about 1.5 up to sometimes two or three milligrams per liter in these storm events. And so work that Pete Vadas, who was with AR, who's, he was with our group for a while as a postdoc, but now he's in the unit, uh, at the Wisconsin uh, ARS unit. Um, he had a network of shallow wells that installed at different depths throughout the site. And what you see uh, is that there's a shallow either a perch system or preferential flow pathways that, that rapid, rapidly deliver very high concentrations of phosphorus, sometimes on the order of 10 parts per million or more, uh, you know, in the upper foot, upper foot and a half, say, of soil. That's, uh, you either get these high water tables in the spring that form, so March, April. Uh, right now, the, you know, we, the water table down at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore is probably within a foot of the surface. And so you get these storm events that just move water very rapidly, and they tend to have very high concentrations of phosphorus. Um, and that's most likely what we believe is the, is the contributing source of phosphorus. That's where your highest phosphor co phosphorus concentrations in soil are, usually in the upper foot. So we have concentrations of, say, 300 parts per million in that upper foot. So that's essentially where we see you know, most of the phosphorus moving. So you know, Pete Kleiman's done some work uh, down on, uh, at UMES. And it's kind of a mass balance approach where we had edge of field flumes looking at the volume of water and overland flow and um, the, you know, the, the loads that were being delivered. And also you can measure the loads in the ditch. And by difference, you can infer that almost 92% of the phosphorus is probably moving in the subsurface. Um, and that's kind of just a mass balance uh, look at it. Um, and just based on some other evidence, you know, we're inferring that you know, the, most, the riskiest sources for phosphorus delivery to these ditches is probably within five to 10 meters of the ditch. And as you move further away, the travel times are long and it's unlikely that they're contributing much, uh, at least on a kind of a regular basis um, to these ditches. So we've gone in, we're planning to go in and, 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 and do some electrical resistivity imaging um, at these sites too, because we're interested in trying to understand more about these sh uh, shallow subsurface flow pathways that are active. And so here we're going in with tracers um, and using the electrical resistivity imaging and the tracers to tell us something about um, shallow subsurface flow pathways. So this is just a test study, really. We didn't, we, we intend to do this under storm conditions, but here we're just kind of testing it out just to make sure we know what we're doing. We're working with a team from Rutgers um, to do this. And so this is Ray Bryant, actually. So he, Ray was here at Cornell for, uh, for his, a good part of his career. He's now working with us at ARS. He's spraying a concentrated salt solution of about five millisiemens um, per centimeter or so of um, just sodium chloride uh, onto this plot here. And we also are injecting uh, the solution into wells. We're just trying to get a response, basically, just to see if the ERIs te can tell us anything about uh, movement of water. And so we're spraying that, and we're basically doing time-lapse ERI, collecting these images of resistivity. And you can see you know, the, kind of these areas of lower resistivity. This is where your, your highly conductive solution is starting to infiltrate and starting to move. You know, and you can kind of look at it over time. We're taking these different time-lapse images, and you can just see the advancement of a salt plume, you know, in the subsurface. So we want to understand a little bit what, I mean, the goal is really to understand, you know, how these subsurface flow pathways develop, how long does it take them to get from the field to the ditch, 
And you can actually get, I mean, the, the images are nice. You can get, I mean, you can do 3D mo you know, videos of these things, of the, of the salt tracers, but you can actually derive quantitative information from the time-lapse ERI. And so we're interested in understanding more about the hydraulics of the system, so that, you know, the conductivity of the, of the soils, uh, the travel times, and some of the other quantitative hydrologic information you can get uh, from these kinds of images. And so we plan to go out this spring, we hope, uh, and inject tracers um, and do it under storm conditions when we expect these shallow flow pathways to be active and to track them. And based on some kind of advanced modeling that we've been doing, um, it, we expect to have to do this over a series of storms. And we thought maybe one storm would be enough to just move it from the field to the ditch, but it turns out that the travel times are quite slow, even just within five or 10 meters of the ditch. You're talking tens of days to, or longer you know, for some of this stuff to potentially move. So we could be looking at probably weeks and weeks of time-lapse imaging to try to see how long it takes you know, the salt to move and also where it's moving. Uh, and that might tell us a little bit something about the pathways that are active and might be also moving phosphorus from the field to the ditch. There's an issue of in infrastructure intensification um, on the eastern shore. So just basically real simple things like uh, the, the, the poultry industry on the eastern shore is concentrating. And so you're, they're constructing a lot of what they call these zero acre farms where it's just poultry litter sheds. They're not growing crops. They're just producing poultry and producing a lot of manure. Um, and so you know, you take a site like this where, you know, this is a kind of a before picture of the, about, you know, using the curve number, kind of the amount of runoff, the amount of storm water you would generate on, on a site. And now, you know, you add four 600 foot by 66 foot poultry barns, and you've jacked up probably just because of the, you know, uh, impervious surface generate, you know, from the barns, you know, 40% increase in the amount of runoff, and all that runoff has to go somewhere. So you have, you know, these ditches, you know, that are probably, you know, gonna convey more flow and probably increase the loads um, of, of, say, phosphorus in, in, in a landscape that's already phosphorus saturated. So mm -hmm. um, this kind of intensification is going on quite a bit. You know, the more we drive down to the UMES, we always see new areas of barns going up. So, and these are the issues that you know that we're concerned about. Is just water management just in and around the barn. So this is a, this is an example just from UMES where I mean they have these kinds of water management problems where you just have a lot of water coming off the barn. And actually, there was a, this particular practice was subsidized by the state of Maryland. Um, and it's not performing all that well. And the consequences of that are, it's, let me back up. This here is what you'll see as ditch eight. It's um, also the ditch that is responsible for about 20 some, 25 or so kilograms per hectare per year of phosphorus loss just in that ditch alone. Um, and it's because it's, this is the shed that was dripping all that water and it also has a, it's a poultry litter storage shed. So it's just these low hanging fruit kind of problems where you, if you do a better job uh, managing the water, you hopefully could do a better job of at least reducing these just substantially high losses of phosphorus that, that we get. So I'll say a little bit about in-stream processes because there's been you know, quite a bit of work done just trying to understand phosphorus uh, movement in streams. Um, you know, most of what we do, you know, we kind of, we do work at say one scale, let's say like a hill slope scale. You know, we may be monitoring also at the small watershed scale. Also maybe at a large, so these are kind of a nested watershed kind of approach, but we're really interested in, you know, what's going on, how these connect, how these different scales connect and what's going on in the streams to help move phosphorus. And so this is some work that Rich McDowell did um, with Andrew Sharpley in the FT36 watershed just looking at you know, the different controls of base flow and storm flow on phosphorus movement in streams. And so here you see phosphorus concentrations at, at four different flumes in FD36. And at base flow, the concentrations tend to increase. Um, and this has been attributed just to the, you know, the sorption capacity of the, of the stream sediments, um, high capacity to sorb phosphorus here and decreasing capacity as you move downstream. And you can contrast that with what you see during storms where you have kind of the opposite, more of a dilution effect basically as you go downstream. So phosphorus concentrations in stream water tend to decline during storms. And that's largely due to having kind of a, basically a critical source area of phosphorus loss here where you have a lot of runoff generation and high phosphorus concentrations in the soils. And then that signal kind of being diluted as you move downstream. But you know, when you kind of just consider what are the, if the annual export patterns of phosphorus, you know, in streams, most of our flows um, are, you know, base flows, 90% of the flows in any given year, um, you know, W38 would be classified as base flow, and maybe 10% of the flows you would classify as, as storm flows. This is just, of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of time, just 10% of the time we have storm flow. Mm -hmm. 
but the annual export you know, is largely driven by storm flow. So 70% of the phosphorus loss is occurring in storms and maybe only 30% or so in base flow. So it's, you know, it's kind of this unequal distribution of you know, phosphorus loss. It's occurring a small, amount of, small portion of the time and it, the highest flows. And there's an interesting study, uh, you know, so, and a lot of that, you know, a lot of that phosphorus loss is, is particulate too, so it's, um, it's moving, you know, with, with sediment. And so there was an interesting study that came out in water resources research uh, from a group uh, led by, uh, I think, Pizzuto out of Delaware, looking at just how long does it take to sediment, and, you know, by, you know, by extension, they're also including things like particulate phosphorus to move uh, from some of these watersheds, say, to the Chesapeake Bay. And so I just picked one of the watersheds where they worked. Uh, the little Conestoga Creek because it's in the Chesapeake Bay and it's really interesting uh, because you know if you just think of sediment transport you know in the you know, suspended sediment transport it's pretty fast you know <laughs> storms can move at quite a distance but you know they, they ran some you know theoretical sediment transport models where they actually tried to account for the role of storage say in floodplains and other areas of the stream system and it's pretty fascinating I mean, these are theoretical models so they still need to be tested you know uh, but it if you account for the time spent in storage, the time average velocity of silt clay, which is probably the, the size fraction that's mostly moving a lot of the particulate P, it's about 0.2 kilometers per year. And if you can just consider that you know, it's at 80 kilometers you know, between, say, that stream and the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, you're looking at you know, greater than 600 years to move phosphorus from that stream down to the bay. Now this is you know, based on some of the modeling work and they're actually going back and looking with different kinds of tracers to, to corroborate what their models suggest. But it suggests millennia in some of these, for some of these streams to really move a lot of that phosphorus. And it's just another one of these system lags that's built, you know, that's built in. That, you know, so they're looking at it from the best management practice standpoint. If you put in BMPs to control sediment and eroded phosphorus loss, how long is it going to take before that signal propagates down, say, to the bay? And they're, you know, based on their work, they're saying, you know, many, many decades to hundreds of years or more before you might see some of that. So that's, I just thought that was kind of interesting. There's a really big issue uh, that you've probably heard about uh, with the Conowingo Dam. And so I thought I'd touch on that a little bit uh, here. Uh, specifically related to Tropical Storm Lee, which is a huge storm that occurred uh, September 7th to the 15th in 2011, one of, the, one of the bigger floods that we've experienced in the Susquehanna drainage. So this just shows the, the kind of the cumulative precipitation that fell uh, across the region, you know, anywhere, uh, you know, six or eight inches or more of rainfall. And here you can see the sediment plume that, are, you know, that was in response to that huge flood. And this is some work out of, you know, from Bob Hirsch, the USGS, just showing the amount of phosphorus um, that was lost in that one single event. And so here's the total phosphorus loss. 61% uh, of the phosphorus load in 2011 was attributed to Tropical Storm Lee. So just, so just for one year, 61% of the load from one event. As a, percent, as a fraction of the last decade, the last 10 years, it, was, it accounted for 22% of the phosphorus loss. And this is at Conowingo. This is where these uh, data are coming from. And 9% uh, of the loss over the last, uh, say, 35 years, the period of record uh, that he looked at, 1978 uh, to 2011. And so, you know, those of us in our group and elsewhere, you know, we've kind of been calling Conowingo Dam as like the world's greatest BMP because it traps sediment, it traps a lot of phosphorus, and it's kind of, you know, this, this barrier between the Susquehanna River and the uh, Chesapeake Bay downstream of it. Um, but perhaps it could be considered one of the single greatest sources of legacy phosphorus to the Chesapeake Bay um, because you're getting, it, it's, its capacity is almost, it's almost reached capacity, uh, the sediment stored behind the dam. It's, it's become almost kind of a pass-through now where it's uh, accumulated so much sediment that now just stuff is passing through. It's not really depositing much behind uh, the dam anymore. Um, and so one thing that's happened that you know, Bob Hirsch reported is that there's been a change in the concentration discharge relationship um, you know, for, between flow and phosphorus. And so now you're getting much higher concentrations of phosphorus for the same flow. So some of these larger storms now are generating much higher concentrations of phosphorus than they did, say, in the past. And so here's, this is Lee here. You've got concentrations of over two milligrams per liter coming out where storms of similar magnitude in the past wouldn't have produced such a high concentration. And work out of Johns Hopkins has also shown kind of an uptick in total P, and this is largely explained by particulate phosphorus con contribution. There's also scour going on behind the dam, too. It's another uh, issue because it's full. So you're seeing kind of an uptick. You had a decline here in total phosphorus in all seasons, really, uh, at Conowingo, and now 
just recently, they're starting to see an upward trend in phosphorus uh, release uh, from, from the dam to downstream. So it's starting to become a source of phosphorus in part due to scour, perhaps due to um, dissolved pea is still actually going down. So it's really a particulate pea phenomenon that's, that's going on behind the dam. But kind of an interesting story. And there's a lot of discussion um, in, in Annapolis and elsewhere about what to do about the Conowingo. They had just released a report last fall on whether they should dredge it or not dredge it. I think this, the recommendation was to not dredge it um, and to leave it alone. But it is, you know, look going forward, something to probably consider in terms of phosphorus management and the challenges it represents. So I'll probably, I'll close here with just some emerging concerns. Uh, and one that I thought is probably most pressing from a nutrient management standpoint uh, is, is kind of the role of climate change on hydrological, hydrological connectivity and phosphorus loss. Um, this is the FT36 watershed, um, one of the sub watersheds um, where, I, where we work. And this just shows the distribution of uh, phosphorus concentrations in soils um, from less than 50 all the way up to greater than 400 parts per million. And so typically with the phosphorus index, what we've done or one approach has just been to try to get at, you know, what's the contributing area for different storms or different or storms of different return periods. And so a real simple way is just to try to come up with a linear distance, a buffer from the stream and, and say that's your zone of risk. And we've typically managed for these frequently occurring one year to two year kind of storms. You know, those are the ones we're most concerned with. They come around most often. And so if you did that just for this particular watershed, you know, your one year storm, you draw a buffer you know, around the system like this. And you would say this is a zone where we're you know, most actively going to protect you know, for phosphorus loss. Um, but recently with these reports that have come out, you, you know, there's been some really interesting uh, findings in terms of, you know, we've seen this, we've looked at our own data. There's, a, there's, a, there's been, for example, a 71% increase in the occurrence of extreme rainfall events from 58, 1958 to 2012. So we're getting more extreme rains, more uh, you know, you know, flooding. Um, there's been an increase in river flooding. Uh, that's in, you know, ac across the US, but most prominently, you know, we've seen upticks in the Northeast. Um, and so in FD36, this is just looking at Tropical Storm Lee as an example, and perhaps it's an extreme case, but yeah, I picked the most extreme because it probably helped tell the story a little bit. But the peak discharge uh, in FD36 was 53 cubic feet, uh, feet per second uh, for Tropical Storm Lee. That equates to about a you know, return period of 73 years um, for that storm. And so a storm that occurs you know, with that kind of frequency um, you know, this is, you draw a 100 meter buffer for a five year storm, you get maybe a, a 10 year storm is a 150 meter buffer. And beyond that, you're, you're kind of, almost the entire watershed is, is at that point a critical source area. I mean, it, that's not to say the entire watershed is generating runoff, but you know, one would presume that any one, any of these areas could conceivably con contributing phosphorus. And so if these storms are gonna become more frequent, uh, at all, if there's, a, if there's a, is any tendency for these storms to become more common, then I think you know, in, in terms of nutrient management, one concern is just you know, how can we manage, how do we manage for these kinds of events? They're also the ones that move the most P. And um, you know, if you look at phosphorus loss just um, in W38, if, you know, Harry Pianchi was famous for saying that you know, it's one or two storms in a year that you know, produce the majority of your phosphorus loss. So it's, if it's storms like this, then you know, how do, you know, how do, we, how do we manage you know, for these kinds of events? And so with that, um, I think I've got about 10 minutes left, so it's probably good that I'm summarizing. Uh, basically, in summary, you know, the, for these sloped areas, it's the hydrologically active areas that drive phosphorus transport, you know, and, and, and those are the areas that we most are interested in, in managing and protecting. You know, in the lowlands, where our, our primary concern is artificial drainage um, and the role of drainage in, in connecting phosphorus sources to receiving waters and, and ways to manage and mitigate, you know, uh, you know, the, the phosphorus moving from the landscape to the stream. Phosphorus transports in rivers is largely event driven and a large of that, a, um, the majority of that's occurring in, in storms and, you know, changes in the frequency of extreme events, um, I would say represent an area of emerging concern, you know, that those of us who are dealing in nutrient management should be um, looking into. And with that, I'm done. I really appreciate your time and your attention, and I'll take any questions that you guys would have. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.